Hi everyone, welcome back. Um, so we are gonna be talking today, right now, about mechanism descriptions, particularly the examples that we uh, are gonna go over in some detail and we're gonna be talking about binder clips. And I gave you some binder clips in class so that you would have a chance to, um, to just kind of figure them out. So what you'll need for this is the Echo Knee Action Vegetable Peeler paper, and I'm going to send that to you by email. Um, then the other example that we're going to discuss is the Rapid C2 Staple Remover uh, paper, and I'm going to send that to you by email as well. With the Staple Remover paper, just uh, really read pages five through nine carefully. You can skim the rest. Uh, I wanted to really focus on pages five through nine, which are where this author really describes how the staple remover works in a pretty good level of detail. Um, so also you should have your assignment sheet with you, which is mechanism description, just one-sided, and key on this is the list of brainstorming questions. So let's start by taking out your trusty binder clips. So um, I gave each of you a couple Maybe you had two mediums or a medium and a big or a small and a medium. I just have a medium sized one here um, and so I'll be using that to demonstrate stuff. Um, so take your binder clip, take a look at the list of brainstorming questions on your assignment sheet. They're at the bottom here. So the questions are what's its primary purpose? What are its secondary purposes? Like what else could it be used for? What size is it? Or if there's a range of sizes, what range of sizes does it come in and why? Um, how is it different from other tools like it? So you might think of this in two different ways. How is it different from other tools that are meant to do the same thing? And then also, are there other tools like it that are similar, but in a totally different context? Like they work similarly, but they're not for holding paper together. They're for something else. What are the parts? And you can kind of name them whatever you want. What is each part made of and why? Like, how does that serve a purpose? Somebody made this decision to make this binder clip the way it is. And so uh, what's it made of and why? Uh, and you wouldn't have to know exactly the kind of metal. You don't have to do research that would sort of explain to you, you know, oh, it's this particular type of, I don't know, stainless steel or something like that. Just saying that it's made of some sort of metal would be enough. Or, you know, maybe you, think that the wires here are corrosion resistant. And so you might say corrosion, corrosion resistant metal. Um, you wouldn't have to go research and see what kind of alloy it is or whatever. Um, what is the purpose of each part? What, are, what, is, what is it used for? How are the parts connected and how do they work together? And so, and really think about the connections and some of the details. And then how would you explain how to use it to someone from another planet? Okay, that's a bit of a goofy question. Obviously, then it brings up questions like, well, do they have hands? Uh, so imagine that this is Star Trek. Uh, once again, you might know that I'm a huge Star Trek fan. Uh, it's one of, the, one of the shows from my childhood. And if you haven't checked it out yet, I think it's on Netflix or something. It's really a lot of fun, all of the Star Trek series. So if you're into sci-fi, uh, that's pretty helpful. So in the Star Trek world, there are a lot of aliens, but unlike Star Wars, most of the aliens in Star Trek just kind of look like people. Um, so I know Star Wars does a lot of like really weird looking aliens, like a lot of Jabba the Hutt and that kind of stuff. Um, in Star Trek, they're all just kind of like people. They might have like bumps on their foreheads or, you know, a green face or something like that. But they have hands that are normal hands. And so I think, imagine that you're explaining it to an alien on Star Trek who's never encountered a binder clip before, but looks and behaves like a person. And also Star Trek has this uh, sort of thing that they've done called the Universal Translator, where essentially everybody can speak English. Somehow what they're saying gets filtered through this thing and everybody can speak English. It's definitely magic. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so imagine, yes, the person can speak English. They're just unfamiliar with binder clips. So you have to explain to them what to do. So take a moment, um, you can pause this video and take your pen or pencil and start writing some stuff down. Um, 
write down what you think the primary purpose is. What, write down some of the secondary purposes you can envision for a binder clip. Start messing with the binder clip and figuring out how the stuff works together. What weird design decisions did someone make in order to make this thing function the way it does? Um, experiment around with it. Play around with the arms, play around with the body of it, or you could call them the levers and the triangle, like whatever you want to call them, that's fine. But start messing around with it and see what you notice. So you can hit pause, spend a little bit of time, take a look at these questions and see what you come up with. Okay, so welcome back. I hope you came up with some good ideas about the binder clip, spent a little bit of time messing around with it. Um, so what's its primary purpose? I wish this were a discussion and you guys could chime in. Uh, so I am assuming that you all considered primary and secondary purposes and discovered that the primary purpose of a binder clip is to hold pieces of paper together. And if you want to be more specific about it, it's to hold a certain amount of paper together in a way that's pretty tight so that it doesn't shuffle around really easily, but also completely removable. So you can take those pages out pretty easily. Um, did you consider as you were doing this, how many pages fit in it? How many do you think? Do you think the medium sized binder clip could get like, you know, it could certainly get 30 might get, so this paper is 11 pages. And that's really, that's a piece of cake. There's tons and tons of room. Um, I think with the large, or the medium sized binder clip, you can play around with it, but you can easily get 80, 90 pages in it, which is crazy because you might look at it and be like, no way. But really, you can get a lot of paper into it. And with a pretty tight hold too. It's like the middle pages don't start moving around. Uh, the large binder clip that I gave some of you holds even more. It's, it's a huge amount of paper. Um, and the small one, you might be like, this is so tiny. It can't really do much. And what's in your mind might be something like 10 or 20 pages. Actually, you can get something like 50 pages in there. So mess around with it and see. But it's surprising how much paper fits into these. So it holds pages together and it holds them together in a removable way. What are its secondary what are some things that you all came up with? So take a look at your notes. Um, if you use these at all, and you will as you get older, you're going to encounter them in offices everywhere. <laughs> They're pretty ubiquitous. And so secondary purposes, uh, you can hang stuff from a push pin. So if you have a bulletin board, let's imagine this pen is a push pin and sticking out of a bulletin board. One of these can hang on it. But then you might be like, okay, so I want to hang a schedule or a picture or something like that. I'm going to clip it. Excellent. If I were to hang this, I've got this random piece of metal sticking out. Or maybe I fold it down, but then it's blocking the text that I would want to show or the picture that I would want to show. You can remove it. I don't know if you noticed that these are removable. So if you didn't notice that they're removable, pull them out. See how it works. Now you have a hanging schedule that doesn't have a piece of metal just sticking out of it, um, which is pretty neat. So they're both removable and in all the sizes, that's true. And then they're really easy to pop back in. So uh, people have come up with all sorts of other weird things. You can actually look it up online. There's all sorts of strange uses for a binder clip. Uh, one that my students often talk about is uh, if you are sitting somewhere right now with a desk or a table that's like fairly thin, the wood is fairly thin, my table here is, is pretty thick, and anyway, I can't figure out how to get my laptop to show you the table, but what you can do is imagine this is the back of your desk. Okay, I'm not actually going to pinch my fingers here, but um, <laughs> this is the back side of your desk. You can take the large binder clip, clip it onto your desk, and run all your cords through these metal things. Um, you know, you can pull them out so you don't have to unplug and replug in your um, your phone cord, your mouse, like whatever you have. You can run the skinnier cords through uh, binder clip and it organizes them. You don't have a massive cords all sort of flying around everywhere. So that's a really nice secondary usage for this. Also, you can use these things to just hold anything together. 
they're great for like bags of chips, um, popcorn, that kind of stuff. Uh, I use the little ones for little bags of chocolate chips or marshmallows. Um, so it's a much tighter hold than those chip clips that they make, uh, which I think like these are great for. So, um, so yeah, people have talked about like in a pinch, you know, pulling their hair back with one. Uh, I have had students say that, you know, um, if you're out on campus somewhere and it's, you know, during the day, you can't get back to your dorm and like the button pops off of your pants. Uh, you know, I've had students say that they've in a pinch used these to hold their pants together um, or they've discovered that their shorts or their pants are too tight. You can fold it in and then kind of just clip it on and take the little uh, levers off and it works. Um, it, it works for the day and your pants won't fall down. So excellent, <laughs> good news. Um, so there's all kinds of secondary purposes. Now, one of the interesting things to ask yourself about these binder clips is what are some other things that have a similar primary purpose? What are some other things that you can use to hold pages of paper together? So take a moment, look at your notes, Think about what else you would use to hold pages together, pieces of paper. So uh, one thing that you might have come up with right away is a paper clip. And that's a really kind of an easy one, right? These are called binder clips. They're kind of glorified paper clips in a lot of ways. So a paper clip is a good way to hold pages together. You might compare them. Think about what are the strengths and weaknesses of each. So when would you want to use a paper clip instead of a binder clip. Well, if I have just a few pieces of paper, let's say this 11 page paper here, um, a paper clip is going to do just fine on a really, really small stack. Also, a, a paper clip lies flat, whereas a binder clip is like bulky, right? So let's say I need to be able to pull these pages apart to read student papers. Um, let's imagine that's the case. Usually I have you staple them, but if I needed to pull them apart and let's say during regular semester, I teach two tech writing classes. So 30 students. Um, if I have 30 students and they all put a binder clip on their paper, then I'm gonna have a big bulky mess to deal with. But if each one puts a paper clip on their paper, all of them are going to lie really flat against each other and it won't be as bulky so that'll be really nice also it's easier to just kind of pull a page out uh, but that can be a weakness too right if you want those pages to stay together properly and not have random pages flying out you need something with a tighter hold rather than a loose hold also these are very reusable um, whereas paper clips you use them a few times and they get loose and it's really hard to hold pages together with them uh, these guys are reusable so they're a lot stronger, they're more reusable. They obviously hold a lot more paper than a paper clip can. Um, so that's a few things that would be a good comparison. Uh, you might think about um, a staple as another thing that holds pages together. So why might a staple be preferable to a binder clip? Well, if those pages are meant to be together for life, then a staple is an excellent choice. It also lies flat. And so that's really nice for, you know, if I've got a stack of 30 papers to grade, um, I want everything to sort of lie flat against each other. But also I don't want parts of your paper getting mixed up with parts of other people's papers. So a staple kind of keeps them together for life. Of course you can use a staple remover to take the um, staple out if you really need to, but usually when people staple stuff, the intention isn't, okay, I'm going to need to take that staple out soon. Um, so staples can be really good for that, but they have a limitation. They're only so long and they have to crimp over the page. And so, you know, you can get 20 pages stapled together, maybe, maybe 25, depending on the stapler. Some of the really heavy duty staplers might be able to do 30. But more than that, you can't really staple them together easily. And more than that, you start to get into the sweet spot for a binder clip. So 
they sort of serve similar purposes, but a little bit different. Um, then you can get a little wackier with some of the other things that you think about that hold paper together. Um, you have a three ring binder or a three ring folder. What are the differences there? Well, when you punch holes in the paper, you're permanently doing something to that paper. Uh, so you don't have to punch holes in paper to use a binder clip, but to do a three ring binder, you do have to punch the three holes. But there are extreme strengths to a three ring binder. It protects your pages from getting beat up in your backpack or from the weather if you're running in the rain or whatever, whereas this doesn't do squat. Um, your binder also allows for you to read the pages front and back and open them fully. And this thing is a huge pain if you want to read your pages front and back or, you know, really do anything with them. So page one, okay, this would be pretty easy to read. But then as I go to page two, this is really annoying. I mean, I can read it, but eh. And if they were front and back, oh man, what do I do with this guy here? Um, what a mess. So... This isn't really for reading stuff, whereas the three ring binder makes it very easy to read stuff. Um, you can think about things like spiral binds and um, uh, book binding as ways that papers are held together in much more permanent ways, right? If you want that book to be together for life, you bind it with glue on a spine and put a cover on it. Um, another thing I often use to hold pages together is rubber bands. And you might be like, oh, rubber bands, they're really annoying. They are really annoying. Um, if you are holding together not too many pages, a rubber band is the worst because you put it around your pages. I don't have one as a prop here, but you put it around your pages and the first thing that happens is they go like this. They roll over and often you don't want that. So that's a problem. Uh, <laughs> but if you're holding together like 300 pages of paper, and they're not meant to be necessarily red, so they don't need to be stapled in a corner, um, or I mean rubber banded in a corner. Um, a rubber band can be great for hundreds of pieces of paper. So I famously use rubber bands for your final papers. When you guys turn in your final papers, I mean, there's only seven of you this time, so I will probably binder clip them together. But um, if I have 30 final papers in each one, let's say on average they're 20 pages long, 30 times 20, you're we're looking at 600 pages. Um, if I'm gonna be carrying those around, I don't want them in a loose stack. Each one is stapled or binder clipped or whatever on its own, so each student has organized their stack, but I've got multiple papers. If I throw a big rubber band around it, then I can carry that stack and it's a lot easier and more manageable. Um, so that's kind of nice. Um, and a binder clip can't really do that with more than a certain number of pages. So rubber bands, for me, pick off or binder clips leave off. Um, so that's some comparisons. There are other things that hold pages together as well, but, um, and you can get goofy with your comparisons. That's perfectly fine. Uh, but it's kind of interesting to think about. We have all these tools that serve a really similar purpose, but they do it in very different ways. Um, what size is it? Did any of you measure this when you were looking at your list of questions. Even if you didn't measure it, maybe you can take a look and figure out roughly what size it is and then what the range of sizes are. So if you have a little one and a medium one, you might be like, okay, so this is pretty little. It can hold maybe, I mean, it really does end up being close to 50 pages. Um, you know, then this guy's bigger, the bigger one, maybe about that big. Um, so what's the biggest binder clip you've ever seen? And if you're holding a big one right now, you might be like, this is the biggest binder clip I've ever seen. They do make novelty binder clips that are bigger, but the large one that you're holding or that I gave some of you, um, that's the biggest standard size. Um, now the small ones that you have are not the smallest standard size. There's an extra small and it maybe is good for about 30 pages. It's very tiny. Um, it looks hilariously small. So, um, so yeah, they do come in a pretty interesting range of sizes. And you might ask yourself, like, what's the limitation? And think about what the limitations are, and you can get really goofy with your thoughts about limitations.
like how big is too big? So in America here, eight and a half by 11 is our standard paper size. If your binder clip overlapped the edge here, if it was wider than eight and a half inches, that would be ridiculous. That would be a problem because like its primary purpose then, this is overlapping it and it's weirdly bulky. It's way too much. Um, also, given that you might have noticed that the proportions on each different binder clip, they're pretty similar. So if this thing, even if it was seven inches long, let's say, it would be so wide down to the bottom that you'd be covering up like a third to a half of your page with this clip, which is also ridiculous. Um, so there's a bulkiness and a largeness that starts to get crazy. Um, and it outweighs the usefulness of this thing. So then you might ask yourself, how small is too small? Um, well, if it can't hold a single sheet of paper, that's too small. Probably if it can only hold two or three, that would also be too small. You would just, you want to use a paper clip and it would be real tiny. Like, so you want it to be manageable in your hand too. Another limitation for how big it's too big is for most of us, we want to be able to open it with one hand easily. So I have what I would consider to be a standard size adult hand. It's, you know, I'm, I'm not a guy with a big hand. Um, I don't have the world's smallest hands. Um, so it's real easy for me to take two fingers and open this, even though it's a bit of a tight open. Um, the bigger ones are fine too, but if it got so big that I couldn't stretch my fingers to open it with one hand, then I'm doing this and that's a little insane. And it sort of, uh, loses all the benefits of the leverage you get when you use your hand to squeeze that thing together. So that's a limitation on size. And you know, this medium size and the large size, they work too for smaller people. So my, um, my seven year old can open binder clips. You know, he's gotta get a little bit of force on some of these, they're a little bit tight, but his hand isn't, isn't the limitation. It's not that he can't get his fingers around it. It's that it takes a decent amount of force. Um, so you might ask yourself, okay, like what are the parts? What's the function? How does this thing work? So I'm curious as to what are some things you noticed about this binder clip when you were brainstorming about it? So take a moment, look at your notes, think about some of the cool things that you noticed. So one thing that's interesting is these are connected these arms, I'll call them arms, are connected to the body. So that's what I'm gonna call this black part. Um, but there's no glue, there's no screws, nothing permanent is holding them together. It's all about the shape here. So the body is like one piece of metal that's cut out and then the edges have little cutouts and they're crimped over. So for ease of manufacturing and for cheapness of making this thing, that's kind of a, an interesting point too. We don't need any adhesive or anything like that. It's all the shapes here that allow for you to squeeze these and get them out. And so, so yeah, that's kind of interesting that it's removable, but very specifically. And if you take a look at the shape here of the cutouts, it's really specific to being able to remove this. You might also have noticed that if you open this past a certain point and let go, it snaps to this position. If you open it here and let go, it snaps to this position. And that makes sense. When you're using a binder clip, you don't want that edge floating back and forth. You either want it open or you want it flat against your page. You really don't want it any other way. So they made that happen. And it's all about just the shape of the metal that they cut out. You might notice a little point on one of these crimped edges. That's the equilibrium point. And you can kind of hit it. I mean, it's really hard to get this thing right there so that it doesn't snap open or snap closed. But even just a little touch and boom. Uh, so that's kind of neat too. Somebody had to think of that. Which is really crazy. Uh, and you might have noticed a detail where you can kind of see it the way the light's shining off of this. The back part of the body here, I might call this the spine, 
um, this top of the triangle as I look at it over here, um, it's got a little curve to it. So when I squeeze this open, it goes exactly the way I want it to. It doesn't bow out, it doesn't crumple in a weird way. And this is some sort of sprung metal. It's, it is the spring. So that's kind of cool too. A lot of these types of things, if you look at like old prototypes, they have a hinge in them with a spring. There's all these ways that they've tried to create a spring that involve extra pieces. And it turns out all they needed was the right metal and the right shape and the right thickness. And it is a spring already. So that was kind of a neat observation. Um, these levers, they have like a hole in the top for ease and cheapness of manufacturing. Of course, this is just a wire that's bent around itself also so that it would be removable. Um, but then this hole allows a secondary purpose, which is for it to hang from a push pin or a nail or something like that, uh, or, or another secondary purpose of putting your cords through this. Um, so a lot of the secondary purposes of binder clips are because these aren't filled in. They're not one solid piece. Uh, they have this little hole in the top. So what, okay, we talked about the connections, how the connections help the parts function together. Um, how would you explain to somebody to use it? So you might be like, well, I don't know, it's kind of easy. First, you'd have to orient it, right? You would tell them first that what they need is a stack of paper that they want to hold together. So now, I've got this stack of paper. How do I explain what to do here? Well, you might def define two positions for the lever arms. One is maybe the open position, the other one's the closed position. So then you'd say, swing your lever arms so that they're in the open position to start with. Then you might tell them to put their thumb on the outside of one of these and their forefinger on the outside of the other one. You might suggest to them to do it in the crook of their forefinger because you can get a little more leverage that way. And you know, some of you might use your middle finger, that's fine too, I'm a, I'm a four finger user. Um, and so then you would have them squeeze it. You would wanna tell them to insert the stack of paper into it, but you'd wanna orient them, right? So, I mean, it's sort of silly. Nobody would really try to insert it this way, but you know, tell them that you might, they may wanna lay this stack of pages flat and then sort of insert them flat into that gap, something like that. Um, so, you know, play around with the wording. It'll give you a bit of a feel for it. But essentially, that's how you do that little user, user guide section. Uh, are binder clips complex enough for this assignment? I would say they're on the simple end, but there's a lot to them. Uh, obviously, you can't write about them because we're talking about them right now. But this type of thing, if it's this level of complexity or higher, that's about right. Um, maybe a little more complex though. So now you know more than you ever wanted to know about binder clips. I will be curious when we come back to class to hear from you what some other discoveries you made about binder clips are. Like, did you try some other secondary uses? Um, did you look online and find any weird sculptures of binder clips or um, just sort of strange uses that are on the internet? Um, did you play around with it and try and clip stuff together and discover things that could be easily clipped and things that couldn't? Um, so I'll be curious to hear if you came up with any insights that are just a little bit further, a little different um, than what I had to share with you. But um, they're very cool and you may never have given this any thought before. I know before I started teaching this class, I had never given any thought to a binder clip. I just used them. It never occurred to me. People had to actually come up with these ideas, really specific things, like what should be the ratio of lever arm length to body length? What should be the shape of this, how long should it be versus how wide it is, or however we define length and width. Um, it's really crazy. There's there's a lot to it. Uh, what should be the thickness of the metal? And you might notice that the smaller binder clips have thinner metal, the bigger ones have thicker metal, and that kind of makes sense. We've got more force going on to it, so it needs to hold up to it if it's bigger. Um, 
but if it's too thick and it's a little one, it's going to be harder to open because we've got shorter lever arms. So a lot to think about. So that's your binder clip. Let's move on. So pull out your Echo Knee Action Vegetable Peeler paper. Uh, this is an interesting one. It is a former student of Professor Ballard. He teaches, well, he used to teach the ethics class and he taught tech writing for a number of years. He's still here at WashU. And he is a wealth of information, really awesome. If you do meet him, you can ask him literally anything about technical writing. He's been at this for a really, really long time. Uh, this was a student of his who graciously let us use their paper. Um, I believe this was a male student, so when we're talking about the paper, we can say he. We don't have to uh, worry about he or she. Um, and as you read it, you might have noticed maybe a lack of the amount of detail that you would have wanted, especially in comparison to that staple remover paper. So um, I don't know how many of you grew up with a vegetable peeler as part of the things that were in your kitchen. Um, I did. It was a slightly different design, but pretty much the same as this in a lot of ways. And so, um, so I, since I am in my kitchen, I have one. Uh, it's not the exact same design, but it's darn similar. Um, you know, it doesn't have a metal handle. It's got like a rubber handle, but the blade is pretty much the same. Uh, the blade doesn't have that little pointy part either, but, um, you know, it's, it's pretty similar. Um, so this is my vegetable peeler. So imagine your vegetable peeler. Think about when you were a kid learning to pe peel a potato or whatever. Um, if you have one right now, like in your dorm room or your apartment, pull it out, play around with it. See if you can discover some stuff about it. So, a really neat way to think about your mechanism, whatever you choose for your mechanism, is um, there's this idea of this three-part view. So think of your mechanism from the point of view of the user. That's the one that doesn't take a lot of imagination. So I'm the user, I'm holding a vegetable peeler, I'm going to peel something with it. Think of it from the point of view of the tool itself, like imagine you are the vegetable peeler. It sounds really weird, but it can give you new insight into how this thing works. And then, in a sort of macabre way for this one, imagine that you are the workpiece, the thing that is being peeled. So the potato, let's say. Let's say you're peeling a potato. So if you imagine you're the user, that's kind of an easy one. So you go, okay, I'm gonna walk, I need to peel this potato. I've got a potato in one hand, and I'm gonna walk up over there to the drawer and get my vegetable peeler. So now I have my vegetable peeler, I'm gonna hold it in my hand pretty tightly, blades facing down, lower it on the potato, and I'll probably push and drag away from me. You can push and drag toward. I tend to drag away because it's a blade. I like to sort of move it away from me. Uh, but you can, there. you will see people who are really good at this. They'll go back and forth really quickly. Um, depending on the potato and the surface and how gnarly it is, I might stick my finger here to sort of lock the angle rather than letting it move freely, even though one of its features is that it moves pretty freely. Um, and you might try to figure out, like, what is it that I do to that potato to get a good peel on it? And we'll hold off on doing that because let's imagine that you are the vegetable peeler. So here you are, a vegetable peeler, minding your own business in the drawer that's dark, but you're with your friend's pizza cutter and garlic press and 10 different kinds of corkscrews. Um, I've got all sorts of random things in that drawer with all the kitchen tools in it, um, different sorts of slicers and peelers and graters and whatever. So you're hanging out in the drawer with your friends and the drawer opens, ah, oh, there's light. <laughs> and, uh, and you're the vegetable peeler. So you're like, pick me, pick me. And today's your lucky day. You get picked. The person picks you up and then you're hoping it's something tasty. I'm hoping that it's an apple. Please let it be an apple. And then it's a potato. And you're like, man, raw potato, dirty skin, but it's better than nothing. 
And so then imagine you're the vegetable peeler and you get to have your face just sort of lowered down onto this potato and you go and you are getting the potato skin coming through this sort of wide mouth of yours that's just coming out the back, um, which is sort of strange and anthropomorphic. And you might be like, I don't know why I'm imagining this thing in this way, but try it. Uh, the last one is to imagine you're the potato and then you don't fare so well. You're the potato, you're hanging out in the basket with your friends, garlic and onion. Um, I got some sweet potatoes in there. Uh, there's usually some ginger root. Um, so it's kind of a nice basket. There's a bunch of stuff, some potatoes. And so if I'm a potato and I'm hanging out in my basket here, as the person comes toward me, I am saying, don't pick me, don't pick me. And wah, wah, today is not my lucky day. So I get picked and I know that I'm going to be skinned alive. Uh, so not the greatest. Uh, <laughs> So then you have this moment of horrible anticipation where you're gonna to be tortured by this vegetable peeler that is gonna be lowered down onto your skin. And uh, so with all of this, imagining you're the potato, imagining that you're the vegetable peeler, imagining that you're the user, which is what most of us imagine, um, you might start to get to the heart of how this thing peels. So take a moment to ask yourself, like. How does it peel? What happens? It's not just a knife, right? It's not as sharp as a knife. Like I can put my finger on this thing and not worry about cutting it. And this is a reasonably sharp vegetable peeler, but like if I grab it in the drawer, I'm not gonna worry that my finger's gonna come out bleeding. And I would worry about that if I was just grabbing a paring knife or a chef's knife by the blade. Uh, so they're not the world's sharpest blades. There's two of them, and there has to be two of them for it to do the thing that it does. And then you're kind of wondering like, okay, but like, how does it peel? How does something that's not that sharp peel? So part of the answer lies in what kinds of things can you peel with it? Um, so take a moment and ask yourself, what kinds of things can I use a vegetable peeler to peel? So a potato, obviously, we've been talking about potatoes, and then apple was another example I gave. Uh, so those are a couple of things that we use vegetable peelers on pretty often. Uh, what are some other things that you're coming up with? So maybe carrots. Uh, you can peel cucumbers with them, and I certainly have. Um, I use a vegetable peeler on ginger. My mother would be pretty appalled by that because you're wasting a lot of good ginger when you do that. Ginger, if you're not familiar with it, is kind of a gnarly root. Um, so there are some like gnarls and some knots and stuff like that. And you're better off with something smooth when it comes to the vegetable peeler, or reasonably smooth. Um, so you can use it on ginger, but you do end up losing a lot of good stuff. Um, and then the places where the root comes together, the little Y shapes or whatever, you have to go in there with a knife anyway. So. It's not the greatest, but I use it for ginger. Um, think about what you cannot use a vegetable peeler on. Can you use it on a tomato? Well, no, but why? It's too soft. Like it's the same size as an apple. So you might be like, it's not the size and it's not the shape that limits it. It's the softness. If you try and push this up against a tomato, it's just gonna squish into it. So that gives us a clue that we need something that has a certain level of hardness to be able to be peeled by this. Um, can you use it on broccoli? No, obviously not, especially on the florette part because it's bumpy and soft and strange. It's a weird shape. Uh, you could use it on the stem portion for whatever reason. I don't know why you would want to, but you could use it on a broccoli stem. But there's no way you could use it on the florets. Same with cauliflower. Um, what else do I have in the fridge? Strawberries. Um, no, too soft, right? Could you use it on peas? No, they're too small. Even if they weren't so squishy, 
they're too small. They would just squish through the gap here. Like, so we need something that's a certain size. Um, could you use it on a watermelon? No. No, you couldn't. For a couple of reasons. One is that if it's a large watermelon, it's too big and the surface ends up too flat at any given point. The other bigger problem is that the rind is too hard. Um, so, but it's weird. I gave you the example of a tomato, which is too soft, and then the rind is too hard on a watermelon. This is a really specific tool that only works with certain things. It has to be soft, but not too soft, but also not too hard. It has to be big, like it can't be peas or edamame, like so, but it can't be like watermelon sized. It's got to be this sort of in-between like an apple or a potato. Um, it can't be too flat like that top of the watermelon that's so huge, but it also can't be too curved. Um, what's going on here? How does this thing cut? So now if you imagine that potato, think about it. So you have to push this down onto the potato. And then when you're dragging it across the surface of the potato, you can't let up on the pressure. You can't let your hand go slack. You have to keep pushing down. What's going on with the potato and the potato peel when you push forward? Well, as you push down and you continue that downward pressure and you're dragging it, a little bit of potato with the peel is bulging into this gap between these two blades. So that's why there's kind of a nice gradual curve on this blade. When you push down on the potato, it doesn't, it's not these really sharp, it's not a sharp angle. It doesn't just cut into the potato. It sort of goes somewhat flat-ish against the potato. Then the potato peel bulges into the gap. Then as you drag it across that blade, cuts into the potato because you've got a bulge on that gap. The bulge moves over and it goes. Um, it's ingenious. And that is not reflected in this paper right now. So the student does kind of take a crack at it. He says, um, the blade peels vegetables by sliding either of the cutting edges along just under the surface of the vegetable, slicing off a thin layer as it progresses. So there is that, but the more detailed mechanics of what's going on there, that's not really clear. So this is a good start, but I would call this more of a rough draft as far as level of detail goes. Um, okay. So when you're thinking about what do I need to go into the most detail about? Think about what makes your mechanism do its thing, its main thing. So this is, again, another thought experiment, and it is really a, sort of a silly one. Um, so there's this movie from the early 2000s called Castaway. Maybe you've heard of it or seen it. Um, it is Tom Hanks. And he gets straight, he's a FedEx delivery guy. He's on a FedEx plane and the plane crashes. The pilot dies. So this Tom Hanks character is the only guy on this deserted island with all these packages from FedEx. Um, if you haven't seen this movie and you're like, what is she talking about? It's essentially the same thing as The Martian. Um, so if you've seen The Martian or read it, which by the way, it's a great book. You should read it. It's a lot of fun. Um, if you've seen The Martian, you know, this guy gets stranded on Mars. The reason I'm putting this on an island in Castaway is, let's say you're opening all these packages and you come across a vegetable peeler. Would you keep it? Sure. Sure you would keep it. You might be able to use it to peel tropical fruits. Um, you might be able to use the blade for something, right? So, okay, so now let's imagine that it's missing a blade section and all I have is the handle. Would you keep it? I mean, if you're not space limited, you might keep it, but would you ever use an oval shaped random piece of rubber? No, I can't think of any use for this thing. Um, 
Now, on the flip side though, imagine that it's only the blade section and you're missing a handle. Would you keep it? Well, yeah. Obviously, it's got blades on it. You could still peel stuff with it. You could hold it with your fingers and, you know, kind of lock it in with your hand and, and peel stuff. You don't need the handle. Um, you don't need that leverage. Like, it's good to have, but you don't need it. Um, and if you could figure out a way to break it in its two endpoints here, then you have two knives. That's even better. Um, the blade section is what you can't live without. Without the blade, it's not a vegetable peeler. Without the handle, it's still a vegetable peeler, right? But the blades are how it does its thing. That needs to be described in a lot of detail. We need to know how your mechanism does its thing. We need to know if it's a pen, how does it write? I think a lot of people get into the mechanics of how the lid or the cap clicks on and the length of the barrel and all of that is important. But if I don't know how it writes, then it's not a pen, you know? How does the ink get out of here and drag along the page? And how does this ball make that happen? Um, the staple remover paper that you were reading, the reason I had you read pages five through nine is those are the pages that explain how the two metal sides come together to actually remove a staple. And he does that in a lot of detail. So, um, so another thing that can be helpful, you are gonna want specific measurements of things and you can do centimeters or you can do inches. Either way is fine, just be consistent about it. You don't want to switch between metric and imperial units. Um, so one thing that can be helpful though is analogies. Uh, you can use analogies for things. So we, when we measure stuff, we have all kinds of weird units for things. Um, there's a unit for everything. There's like, there's a unit for viscosity. And I don't know what it is. I can never remember what it is. I always ask you guys because someone is like, oh yeah, I know. It's like, there's time in it and then there's meters squared in it. Maybe it's like seconds per meter squared or meter squared per second. It sounds more like it. I don't know. So there's time and there's space and the space is squared. And so it's all about like how the liquid travels in a certain way. Um, but if you just give me a number to describe the viscosity of something. I wouldn't know what it meant. I wouldn't know like, is that viscous or not? Is it like thick? Is it thin? And so one thing that's helpful is to include analogies. Uh, you can say it's about the consistency of peanut butter. Okay, I can imagine that. It's about the consistency of mayonnaise or olive oil, water, um, those are all things that I can imagine. I can imagine what that viscosity would be, what that sort of thickness of that liquid would be and how it would travel. Honey is like really thick, right? If you take a container of honey and you turn it upside down to get the honey out, like it takes a while for that honey to travel to the bottom and you have to wait and to kind of shake it a little bit. Uh, and that's absolutely not the case with a bottle of olive oil but that's still thicker than water. Um, so viscosity, that's an example of just some random unit that nobody would know, but you could explain it in a way that makes sense to a layperson. Similarly, I have a couple examples here that I like um, a lot because they're very weird units. So have any of you ever heard of a Scoville unit? That's S-C-O-V-I-L-L-E. -L -L -E. You don't have to Google it here because I'm gonna tell you about it, but you can, and there are a lot of people who know what a Scoville unit is. Um, if you're into food, that's a clue. You might know what a Scoville unit is. So a Scoville unit measures the hotness of a chili pepper or a hot sauce, how spicy it is. Um, and the actual way they do it is they are measuring the, in some way, the amount of capsaicin in the pepper. And um, there's, measurement for it or something like that. But if I just gave you a number, you would have no idea what it meant, uh, unless some of you are foodies and then you'd be like, I know exactly what that means. So if I say this pepper is 
150,000 Scoville units, where this pepper is 5,000 Scoville units. This pepper is 200 Scoville units. Let's say I say 200 Scoville units. You might be like, 200? It sounds like a lot. It sounds really hot. Uh, it's not. It's not at all. Um, 200 is pretty much nothing as far as hotness of a chili pepper. It might not even register for most of you. Uh, jalapeno is about 5,000. Habanero is 150,000. That sounds right. Um, Tabasco sauce is somewhere in the 3,000 range. So a jalapeno, we're talking about fresh jalapenos, not pickled jalapenos, but like a jalapeno pepper is 5,000. Um, but if I told you, okay, it's about as hot as a jalapeno, you'd be like, oh, I can imagine that. Um, or about as hot as those little crinkly banana peppers at Subway. You'd be like, that's not that hot. All right. It's about as hot as Tabasco sauce. Um, it's as hot as a habanero. Maybe you're not familiar with habaneros. They're hot. Um, so if I describe heat level, and I'm not talking about temperature heat, I'm talking about spiciness, but if I describe it based on things that you might be familiar with, that's gonna be a lot more uh, effective than just throwing out a number there for Scoville units. The other interesting one I have is there's something, I don't know if any of you are into craft beer, but if you're a beer aficionado, there's something called an IBU. And so you're looking at that and you're like, it's three letters. What is that? What's an IBU? They are international bitterness units. They are the measurement of how bitter a beer is. And that's kind of an odd measurement. So if I were to tell you something is, you know, 115 IBUs, you'd be like, what does that mean? Is it, is it bitter? Is it not bitter? On the heels of this discussion of Scoville units we had, where two, 200 was like nothing, you might be like 115, I don't know, that doesn't sound that bitter. In fact, it's really bitter. I think it's somewhere around 120 that saturates your taste buds to the point where anything beyond that pretty much tastes the same as 120 IBUs. So that's essentially the max of your scale. Um, it's as bitter as can be. Um, Nobody would know that unless you're t speaking to people in the beer industry or people who are sort of true beer aficionados. And I think this is an interesting um, study in audience as well. I, a number of years ago, went uh, with some friends to a beer festival over at Schlafly Bottle Works, which is in Maplewood. And um, they had like a menu printed of all the beers that they were pouring. Uh, it was a big tent and they did this big thing. So they had a menu printed. And I thought it was a really good way to hit two different audiences. One is an audience that's drinking these but doesn't know anything about beer. Another is an audience that's really, really into beer. So it had the IBUs listed for each beer. It had what variety of hops is in it. Like there's something called a ninja hop. Um, so some of them had ninja hops in them. So there's all these different hops. And as a layperson, like, I don't know what hop does what. Uh, beer is made of hops. That's about as far as I, I don't even know where the hops end up in the process. The number of IBUs mean nothing to me. But there was a, there was a narrative description of each also. Slightly bitter and a little bit sweet with a hint of blueberry on the finish. All right. I can imagine that. That works. So... If you're able to tell things in narrative in a way that makes sense and analogies can be great for that, then it gives us a little bit more of a background in what's going on. So if I were to describe a beer as, as, as bitter as Bud Light, you go to Wash U, we're in Anheuser-Busch country, maybe you've tried a Bud Light before. Um, even if not, that's a pretty ubiquitous beer. A lot of people would know it. Uh, so you could explain that it's slightly bitter about as bitter as a Bud Light, and that would give us an idea. So analogies can be really great. Um, so let's get back to the vegetable peeler paper here. And I wish I had come up with a way to have a split screen here where I could keep the paper and point stuff out on it, but I have not mastered that technology yet. I don't really know how to do that with my computer here at home. So. I'm just going to kind of take you through the paper. Um, 
Well, let's think about the intro. So reread the intro here. You might have to pause it to give it a moment. Um, reread the intro and mark it up. Really figure out if I were explaining to my peer what they might do differently, what would I notice and what would I suggest to them? So you can pause now. So, maybe you're going through here in the intro and saying, you know, do I need the patent number? No, you don't. You get rid of that. So the Echo Knee Action Vegetable Peeler is a kitchen utensil. So that defines it, right? That's the class of things it's in. It's a kitchen, kitchen utensil with a two-edged blade. Two-edged, by the way, should have a hyphen in it which is used for peeling vegetables. You could lose the witches and be fine. So you end up with the Echo Knee Action Vegetable Peeler is a kitchen utensil with a two-edged blade used for peeling vegetables. Um, so that definition looks pretty good. While a simple paring knife serves a similar purpose in food preparation, maybe this was before the days of spell check, but spell check or not, you are responsible for making sure that your paper doesn't have spelling mistakes. So make sure you read over it as a human and don't just let Microsoft Word do its thing. But spell check would have caught purpose here. But while a simple paring knife serves a similar purpose in food preparation, the knee action vegetable peeler has the advantages that the cutting edges face each other for safety and that the blade rotates to follow the contour of the vegetable without the user having to rotate his hand while peeling. That's such a long sentence and it's really hard to follow. There's a lot of stuff there, and you can cut this down to about half and retain what it does and what it is here. While a simple paring knife serves a similar purpose in food preparation. Well, what is that purpose? We already know what that purpose is. It's peeling, right? So you could say, while a simple paring knife peels well, comma. So now, the next part, the knee action vegetable peeler has the advantages that the cutting edges face each other for safety. Well, safety is necessarily an advantage, right? So you wouldn't even have to delineate it as an advantage. You could just say, the knee action vegetable peelers cutting edges face each other for safety and its blade rotates to follow the contour of the vegetable. Ready? What is the opposite of the user having to rotate his or her hand while peeling? This is manual, right? Manually. Automatically. Automatically is the opposite of manually, right? So you could say the blade rotates to follow the contour of the vegetable automatically. And that is a lot shorter and it says the same thing. Um, then you've got the primary components of the device listed. Uh, there should be commas around as shown in figure one. It's a non-restrictive element. If you're ever wondering about commas in the middle of a sentence and where they go and when, uh, look up restrictive and non-restrictive. That'll answer like 90% of your questions. Um, we will talk about it in class too. But you're gonna want as shown in figure one to have commas around it. Then we've got the handle, the blade support rod, and the blade. That's really nice. Those are the sections then in the paper. Um, they call it blade support rod in the intro, in the text. But then in the image over here, it's just called support rod. Remember, whatever you name a part, that's its name for the whole rest of the paper. So be really consistent. Um, you know, you might say, well, support rod, blade support rod, they know what I'm talking about. Be really vigilant about it. Pick a name, stick with it. Um, so then we've got these images here. Um, not bad for not having digital photography, right? Um, the, these really do illustrate the vegetable peeler pretty well. Um, I've got one thing to point out to you here. Here are the tabs to prevent rotation. Do those tabs actually prevent rotation? Do they like prevent it from happening? No. Prevent is 100% work. It's, it's a yes or no, it's a switch. It's a zero or a one. You either prevent it or you don't. So it's not the right word. Um, you could have tabs to limit rotation. 
tabs to, I think the student later in the paper uses the word restrict. They could restrict rotation. Um, they could prevent over rotation, but they're not preventing rotation. That's not accurate. Um, so just be very careful with your word choices. Uh, and you know, you don't have to worry about that on rough draft, but as you're coming through and going through and really deciding what verbs to use, be as precise and as accurate as you can. Um, so then we've got this section about the handle. Take a moment and ask yourself what you noticed in the handle section, what you would have wanted to know more about. So I think this student spent a whole lot of time talking about the manufacturing process of the handle, which isn't really that relevant to its final function. Um, you know, it's cool and all that it is a 1 16th of an inch stick, thick strip of metal, which we do need to know how thick it is. Um, but then it's in a contoured loop and then it's spot welded and it's like wrapped around. You could have some of that, but there's no mention of its final size. How long is it? How wide is it? What does that have to do with a hand, <laughs> right? What does that have to do with an adult or sort of a, you know, older kid hand? The fact that, you know, it's not this long, it's not from here down to here, because that would be insanely large and it might not fit very well in your drawer. So you want it to be kind of compact, but you want it to have enough handle that you don't have to hold it with your fingers, that you can wrap your whole hand around it and get a really good grip. Um, the thickness of it has something to do with that as well. The shape of it as an oval does also. Uh, it's not a rectangle. They want those softer edges. You don't want things digging into your skin while you're while you're peeling a vegetable. So, so yeah, I think um, discussing more about the final shape and less about the manufacturer that got there, um, that's going to be important, right? Uh, so, I mentioned size here. What size is this vegetable? So I look at the paper, your instinct would be like, I don't know, about this big, about this big. Well, okay, I have a vegetable peeler, so I know what size it probably is. Uh, it doesn't say in the intro right now, or really anywhere, except for that the handle is 1 16th of an inch thick, and that the blade support rod is 1 8th of an inch, and I guess that's diameter, it doesn't really say. So when you're reading the intro, if you are unfamiliar with vegetable peelers, you have no idea how big this is. This is like a tiny little dainty vegetable peeler that is good for little peas and edamame grapes. Is this a giant sword of a vegetable peeler that we're going to use to play baseball with, or uh, I don't know depending on your country that you're from. Uh, maybe cricket might make a good cricket bat. It's got a little bit of a flat side there. Uh, you know, what, what is this thing? What, what size is it? So you wanna give an overall size in the intro. And then all those little sizes are nice to have along the way. Um, it's just, if we don't know how big it is to begin with, it's hard to envision what's happening. And the first size that pops up here is the 1 16th of an inch thickness of the handle. Uh, which is really not as important a size as like how long is the blade or how long is the whole thing? How long is the handle when you put it together? Um, those are important details. So we need more on sizes. Um, let's take a look at page two here. Uh, there's that restrict the rotation of the blade. So that's correct. Okay, so when you look at the blade support rod section here, there's a couple of points I want to make, and you probably already noticed at least one of these. Um, the first point, which you may not have noticed, is that the language gets a little too engineering specific, a little too technical for a layperson. And you might be like, really? My art side classmates definitely know what axial and lateral mean. No, they don't. They don't. They might see axial and be like, does that have something to do with an axle? Isn't that like spinning kind of? 
lateral maybe they know from like your b-school classmates would be like oh yeah when people switch jobs and they end up moving from one company to another but in the same position that's called a lateral move uh so people can puzzle it out but they don't know it right off the bat so you're going to want to use language that's a little simpler and a little bit more universal um the other thing though is that this section has a lot of passive voice. And we talked a little bit about passive voice already, but there's always more to learn about passive voice and active voice. Uh, so an example here is the last sentence in the blade support rod section. The rod is kept from sliding out of the handle by a mushroom-shaped knob outside of the handle and is kept from sliding too far into the handle by two protrusions inside of the handle. So the clue here that it's passive voice, there's two clues. One is that you have by this and by this in your sentence. I've got by a mushroom shaped knob and by two protrusions. Those are the doers. Those should actually be the subject. The other clue is that you're looking at a lot of to be verb here. You're looking at a lot of ases. The rod is kept from sliding out of the handle by a mushroom shaped knob. That should be flipped. A mushroom-shaped knob outside of the handle keeps the rod from sliding out of the handle. And you can do the second half separately. Um, you know, two protrusions inside of the handle keep the rod from sliding too far into the handle. And here they're calling it the rod. Maybe rod would have been the right name for it to begin with, so you don't have to go blade support rod, blade support rod, blade support rod every single time. Uh, so... Yeah, passive voice, clunky, hard to follow. And when you flip that around, it becomes very easy to read. Um, then we get to that blade section. And I know we already talked a little bit about, you know, earlier on about how we need to know how the blade works. And there's just not enough detail here. There's not really enough detail. How sharp are these? What angle are they at? Like, what is that angle? And you can estimate it. You don't have to measure it exactly. I don't know exactly how you would measure it, but um, what what is that angle? So then the sort of, it says it becomes sufficiently wide between the tabs on the handle, so it is restricted to 130 degrees of rotation before being stopped by the tabs. So we get the idea of the rotation, but we need a little bit more of the configuration of the blades and how it actually slices the potato peel or the vegetable peel or whatever. Um, and that's just not clear. Also, these images are, I know this is harsh, they're kind of useless to me. I don't really know what I'm looking at here. The side view, all that side view seems to illustrate to me is that there's this cool little hook in the front of um, the vegetable peel or this thing. And then the student proceeds to not talk about that feature at all. The end view and the view from the handle are completely useless to me. I have no idea what I'm looking at. And it's not because of their artistic skill or lack of it. Actually, they have a lot of artistic skill here. I'm not sure why I'm looking at that. I don't know what they're trying to illustrate to me. Is it the angle of the blades at, and kind of flattening out to each other? Is it how they're attached to the handle, where in the handle configuration they are? I don't know what I'm supposed to be looking at here. So more arrows pointing out the features and really stick with the views that illustrate the things that you're talking about. So almost imagine if you're explaining your mechanism to someone and you have them with you, and you have the mechanism with you, if you're explaining it to them in person, any time that you might point at something to explain it, that's a good time for an image that has arrows pointing or you know lines pointing to the features that you're talking about. So if I want to talk about how this gap between the blades is a certain distance, and that's a good distance for the thickness of a potato peel to not get stuck in there. Um, then maybe I have an image that shows a view of it kind of dead on like this and this measurement labeled. If I want to show the angle that the blade sort of comes down at, I might have to take a picture like this but really talking about the angle. That's a little hard to see though. Um, I might draw that one because I think I'd do a way better job drawing it than being able to illustrate it with some picture 
that just kind of looks like a U shape and it's hard to see what's going on there. Um, so think about what you want to show them, what features are important that you're talking about and they have something to do with the function of it. So that's a little note on the blade section. Also, how sharp are the blades? Really, one of the coolest things about bunches of things that cut, graters, slicers, nail clippers, um, whatever those things are, can openers, um, all of these are these are really cool implements that cut something, but they're not that sharp. And it's like, but how does it cut then? It's not that sharp. How is it so effective? And usually that has to do with leverage. That has to do with the angles of the blades. Um, you know, nail clippers are really cool. And I know I've banned you from writing about them, but um, they're really cool because the blades are so dull. They're not even really blades. They're just thin edges, but they come together with such force that they can just chop your nail off. Um, it's amazing. And it's all about the levers. Um, so with blades, we need to know how sharp are they and why? Why don't they have to be that sharp? Um, then the conclusion, so we're looking at page three here. All right, the Echo Knee Action Vegetable Peeler is a handy kitchen utensil for peeling any kind of vegetable. Any, really? Because I think we came up with a ton of vegetables that you cannot peel with a vegetable peeler. Um, and I can come up with a bunch more, but you know, peas and broccoli and cauliflower are among them. Um, snap peas, edamame, which are soybeans, um, you know, corn, you couldn't peel corn with a vegetable peeler. There's tons of vegetables you can't. So a word like any, that's too extreme. Be really careful with extreme words like any, all, none. Um, you're going to want to soften that. Many kinds of fruit, you know, it, they could have just said for peeling many fruits and vegetables. And then they don't have that any in there. Uh, it is we, unique with regard to a paring knife. All right, a little clunky, but works. Uh, because of the blade's ability to rotate and thus follow the contour of the vegetable being peeled, that does make it unique. Um, the peeler is available almost anywhere at a reasonable cost. Not true. Almost anywhere? I bet that if you tried to buy a vegetable peeler anywhere on the Danforth campus of WashU, you couldn't do it. And there are a lot of stores and a lot of places where you can buy things on the Danforth campus at WashU. Um, you can't buy it from Subway. I don't think the bookstore sells vegetable peelers. Maybe something on the South 40 does. I don't know. I'm not super familiar with today's South 40. But it, you would have a tough time finding a vegetable peeler to buy. Uh, so that's not true. You could say it is available at almost any kitchen store at a reasonable cost. That's probably true. Um, you know, so just be careful again. Uh, so, and then there's some ideas of using a more corrosion resistant alloy, which I think is a good idea. And that's something that you could put in the conclusion. Uh, this is a conclusion though, not a summary. So again, be accurate. A summary means you're summarizing things you've already said. And that is not what you need here. You don't need a summary of your uh, mechanism description. It's a short document and nobody needs to be reminded of all the things you've already said. So what you're gonna have is a conclusion and that's what this student has. It's just, he accidentally called it a summary. So be careful. Um, he did not have to have a user guide because that particular assignment didn't require it. I'm requiring that you guys also include a user guide. Very sort of brief user guide um, on the vegetable peeler thing. It might be, you know, hold the vegetable peeler in your dominant hand with your hand wrapping around the handle. Um, then you might suggest to them to get a potato or whatever vegetable to be peeled and hold it tightly in the other hand. Um, lower the peeler with the blades facing down onto the skin of the vegetable. Push down and while applying downward pressure, drag the vegetable peeler away from you. Um, now, if you had safety concerns, those are things that you should note first. So the very beginning, 
you should say the vegetable peeler includes blades that are reasonably sharp. Be careful about your fingers. Um, before you have us peel, you don't want that note at the end. You don't want to be like, oh, by the way, you could have cut your finger off. Make sure you didn't do that to go first. Uh, in this case, it's not the sharpest thing in the world, so you wouldn't have to caution them too much. But, um, but if you did want to include a note about that, it belongs in the beginning. Um, so that's kind of what you would do with a user guide. Now, the reason I had you take a look at the... All right, where is that? Where is it here? The reason I had you take a look at the staple remover paper is, wow, what a difference from the vegetable peeler. So if you do take a look at pages five through nine, I'm sure you would have noticed that this student is... No, I almost lost everything. Okay, hang on. Oof, there we go. Uh, this student is extraordinarily detailed. The images are so detailed and well labeled. I mean, look at that. We've got top pivot arm. Okay, I'm trying to do this in mirror image, which is a little hard, so I'll come around here. Clasp cutouts, manufacturing cutouts, and we've got the bottom pivot arm. Here's a pin cutout. Here are more manufacturing cutouts. All of those are labeled. Then he has a figure number and a caption. Cutouts and pivot arms. Uh, by the way, figure seven did have dimensions on it when he turned it in to me. I believe he drew them in because he couldn't quite, or if he didn't draw them in, for some reason this didn't translate when he emailed me this paper, but um, the original one did have dimensions here. Um, so each figure has a caption. It has a figure number. Then he's able to refer that figure number in text. Uh, and the figures, they've got everything labeled. Um, the detail about how these are curved, it's a really excellent level of detail. Uh, do I know how to measure the interior radius of curvature? No, not at all. And maybe you don't either, and that's fine. Um, I think that this student knew how to do it, so he wanted to showcase that, and that's great. I would have to use descriptive language to say that it's slightly curved. I might say like the top quarter of a circle or something like that, but maybe not. Um, I'd have to play around with it. But the idea that these curves are just perfect for a staple to slide up, and then as the two parts of the staple remover close on each other, the staple has been pulled all the way out of the page. Um, that's so cool, and I learned something new about staple removers when I read this paper because I've experienced a lot of cheap staple removers. And so when I was reading the student's user guide, I was like, we forgot to tell them when you close on these arms or whatever he called them, the teeth, when you close the staple remover, you forgot to get, tell them to give it a yank at the end. Um, and he said, if you have a good staple remover, you don't have to give it a yank. The staple's already all the way out. And sure enough, it was, you know, he showed me. So I've had a lot of cheap staple removers. They don't quite have the right angle. They're a little wonky and a little off. And so you don't get the staple almost, you know, you maybe get it almost all the way out, but not all the way out. But this had the perfect angles and the perfect curve to where by the time you're done squeezing it, that staple's out. Um, there is no yank, uh, which is so cool. And that came through in this paper. And I thought, wow, I learned something that I never knew about a staple remover before. And he did a really great job describing everything in really excellent level of detail. Um, if you think he overkilled it a little, especially with the sub, sub, sub sections, yeah, okay. Uh, this is section 2.2.2.1, maybe a little much. Uh, you know, maybe he could have just done that as an extra paragraph of section 2.2.2 without giving it its own section, but it's fine that he did. And it worked out really well. This is organized, it's clear. Um, so he just really knocked this one out of the park. Um, I will mention, if you read the intro, there's a rather hilarious um, analogy in there. And it's just, I find it hilarious because it's hilariously wrong. Um, he explains, this mechanism removes the staple in a similar fashion to a mother picking up her child from a crib. Um, it occurs to me as I read this that this student has never picked up a child from a crib before. He imagines that it would be like, okay, well, 
I don't know. This is awkward. All right. <laughs> that it would be like this. And then you would just like pick the kid up. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, that's not at all what you do. <laughs> so if it's like an infant, you do have to get your arms under them, but you don't like lock your fingers. Uh, you would slide one arm under them. And uh, if it's a bigger kid, you just pick them up under their arms. Uh, there's none of this. But I could see where he was going. In your, in your imagination, that's how you would imagine picking up a kid from a crib, that it would be really similar to a staple remover. And it's just not. Uh, so, I mean, he still did an excellent job on this paper. He still got a really, really high grade, um, some kind of A+. Plus. Uh, but, you know, that was an analogy that fell flat. Take the risk, though. Come up with the analogy. Uh, what's the worst that could happen? It becomes clear to your readers that you've never picked up a kid from a crib. No big deal. Uh, I get the idea. So, um, so that's a good example of how even the best papers sometimes have little things in them that could be improved. Um, and that's okay. That's with all writing. Everything I write, if I go back to it, I always see things that I would change. Uh, no matter how many times I've gone through it, whether it's published or not, I always look back and I see flaws that I would change, things that I would tweak, things that I would make more clear, more active voice, shorter. Um, and so, you know, this will be as finished a draft as you can do in the time you have, but you might look back at it two weeks later and be like, oh, I would have changed this one little thing. And so maybe this student would have looked at the analogy and had a reader for it and they'd be like, dude, that's not how you pick up a kid from a crib. And he'd be like, oh, I'll come up with a different analogy. Um, so, but this was an extraordinarily successful paper. He really thought of the details. He defined the orientation of top and bottom and front and back. He defined all the parts. He just really um, did a great job going into detail to where at the end you have no questions about how this thing works. Um, you could almost build it yourself. It's really, really detailed. So, um, so I hope that's what you took away from reading the staple remover example. Um, there are a few more examples online on the course website, which is the Weebly website that's on the syllabus. And um, you can take a look at those. I think one's like a tape dispenser. There's a floss dispenser. Um, if you are picking a mechanism and then you are looking on the website and you're like, oh no, there's a, I picked a tape dispenser and there's a tape dispenser example. Uh, don't look at it. Don't read it. Because then it's going to be almost impossible to write about the tape dispenser without plagiarizing ideas, right? Um, but there's only two or three possibilities. So my suggestion would be go on the course website, go ahead and read the examples, and then don't write about any of those things. Pick something else. Um, I think one of them is a fountain pen. That's an example. Uh, but I did not publish any mechanical pencils or retractable pens online, so uh, those are totally doable. Uh, another question people have had that I forgot to mention in the previous video was, can I describe a lock and a key? Uh, it's a great mechanism to describe, but here's the problem. You can't actually observe it most of the time. Unless you are an amateur or professional lock picker and you have one of those kits that's clear that you can see inside of it, and see what the pins are doing, you can't actually observe what's going on. So then what ends up happening with those mechanism descriptions is those students look the whole thing up online. And even if you cite it, then what you're doing is just citing research that you've done and describing stuff that someone else figured out. This is an opportunity for you to figure something out. So pick a mechanism that you can actually observe, um, like Ben here observed the staple remover and messed with some staples, um, the vegetable peeler. So even if it's something that you grew up with that's at home, um, if you don't have access to it now and you're not going home, but you're like, oh, that's the perfect thing. If it's small, maybe have your parents send it to you. They could stick it in a package and stick it in the mail. It could get to you in a few days. Um, and you have a little bit of time here. So, you know, that's a possibility. But I would suggest just scour your apartment for stuff that you already have. Um, your office supplies, your bathroom, your whatever you have around. There's all kinds of interesting boxes with hinged lids and um, cases with locks and backpack buckles and zippers. And I mean, 
fasteners of all kinds. Um, so all of this is fair game. Uh, so start thinking about topics as well. And I hope that looking at these two examples gave you a little bit of an idea of what to do and how to go about this. As we fine tune uh, what we're doing here, I will give you more information about what goes in each parts section. Uh, I can tell you right now in brief though, so you don't have to wait till we're in class, um, with each parts section, you're gonna wanna describe like what's the purpose of the part? What is its main function? Then you can go into size, shape, materials, and if, the, if your whole mechanism is the same material, maybe you put the material information in the intro so you don't have to list it in every part section. Or if it's almost all the same material, but there's one part that's different, you could say that in the intro, and then you only really talk about the different parts material in, uh, in that part section. But size, shape, material, uh, connections with other parts, how it works, you'll want to describe how it works. How does this thing rotate? How does it stop rotating? Interactions with other parts as well. So this is touching the tabs and that's what's stopping it from rotating further. Um, but then you might say, but uh, okay, so I'm doing that. But then when I'm talking about the tabs, I'm talking about that same interaction, right? Yeah, you are. But you're kind of talking about it from the point of view of a different part. Um, you're, here you're talking about this rotation from the point of view of the blade section and the fact that it doesn't over rotate because the tabs stop it. Here there's only one tab, but in the paper there were two. Um, and how that tab stops it. In the tab section, you would talk about, oh, there actually are two, there's one back here. Uh, in the tab section, you would talk about the two tabs, their length and how they jut out and how they stop the blade from over rotating. It's the same thing, but from two different points of view. And you might wonder, like, is that redundant? Isn't that redundant? It's a little redundant, but it's okay. What you want is that each section stands alone. So if someone was interested in how a particular thing worked and they just flipped to that section, they'd be able to get everything they needed without it saying, as described in section 2.1, so then they have to flip back to 2.1, and then as described in future section 4, and then they have to flip up to 4. You want to minimize the amount of flipping back and forth. So give them everything they need of course, if you've described something really in detail in one section and you want to do a real brief description in another section, you can refer them to the previous section. So if you were talking about, uh, let's say, a nail clipper, you talked all about leverage and how levers work in the section about the top handle. If you were then talking about the base of it, also kind of being the complement to that lever, or if you were talking about the two blades coming together with enough force because of the leverage of the handle, you wouldn't have to re-explain all about leverage. You could send us to the handle section if we had questions, but I wanna minimize that amount of flipping back and forth. Uh, so use it very sparingly and it'll be fine. Um, so that's kind of the main things that go in each parts section. Then for each parts section, you're probably gonna want an image of that part with its sub features listed and you can then break, break it out into subsections that have those features described in more detail, or they could just be different paragraphs or formatted in some way so that we can see, okay, we're on to the next feature, and now we're on to the next feature. Um, but those subparts or features, you're gonna wanna kind of highlight in some way. So that's something that also uh, Ben's staple remover paper does a really good job of. He, has subsections for each little feature. Um, and I think the organization, like if, if you're struggling with organization, you're like, you know, I would really love to have paper to mimic the organization of. This is a good one, do it. Uh, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. If you like the 2.1, 2.2, 2.2.2 scheme, you can do it, that's fine. Uh, it works, it's tried and tested. Uh, numbering sections works out well, so. But if there are other ideas you have, you certainly can use them. And some of the other examples online will show you that. So that is a little bit about these papers. I am going to send you more stuff about your proposal. Um, so stay tuned for that. But at least now you have a pretty good background on the mechanism description. You can get to work on that. So thanks very much. Uh, and I will.